Some of you may not know this, but uh, Greg Amelung, our executive pastor, is actually a certified personal trainer, former gym owner and manager. And um, if you were to hire him as your personal trainer, which you can't because he's not looking for clients, but he still does two or three, I think, early mornings before he starts to work for us. But if you were, I doubt you would hire him so you could meet Greg at the gym at five o'clock in the morning and sit on the weight bench and talk about how awesome it is to work out. Nobody's going to pay good money and show up somewhere four or five mornings a week at five in the morning in their work clothes to sit on the bench press and talk about it. I don't care how good the professional is, and Greg's really good, that's probably not what you want to do with five o'clock in the morning. If you hire a personal trainer, you expect, I'm going to show up in my workout clothes, and we're going to lift those weights. And yes, I'm sure Greg will teach me things and show me proper form and walk through why we're doing this particular thing in your routine at this particular time. But the expectation is, show up and put in the work. Greg will do his part, but you got to show up willing and able to do your part. And that is a whole lot like the good news that I get to proclaim today as we conclude Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. To learn from Jesus without practicing what he says is a foolish and unstable way to live your one and only life. Wise people build their lives on an unshakable foundation by choosing again and again. I'm going to love like Jesus. I'm going to live as Jesus. And the wise in that process become human again, while the foolish lose it all. That's what Jesus tees up here in this last picture he gives us in his sermon. He says, everybody who hears these words of mine, there have been a bunch of words in the sermon, and puts them into practice is like a wise builder who built a house on bedrock and when the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and beat against that house, it did not fall because it was firmly set on bedrock. But everybody who hears these words of mine and doesn't put them into practice will be like a fool who built a house on sand and the rains fell and the floods came and the wind blew and beat against that house and it fell and it was completely destroyed. Now, if you've been tracking with us in this final series, the 10th one here, we've called Choices, you're aware that by now Jesus is going through a quick succession of images that play off the two ways tradition in Hebrew teaching. He's contrasting two options so that we're empowered to choose between the two. We heard him talk about a wide road, which is where he said most people choose to live on the wide road, and in the end, it's just destruction. There's a narrow road, though. It always leads to life. It's just that not too many people end up there. You got two choices. Last week, Jeremiah had a fantastic message about several of these contrasts. Jesus talks about true and false teachers or prophets or influences and how they produce true and false disciples who produce good and bad fruit. And you'll know which ones are the true and false ones by the fruit that they produce. It's an important, important rubric for us at the end of this message. And now here, he brings it all down and he says, if you want to choose life in my kingdom of love, over all the other ways available to you, be aware this is the choice between a wise person and a foolish person. You can live a wise life or a foolish life. Because to learn from me without practicing what I say, he says, is a foolish and shaky way, unstable way to live your one and only life. Wise people will build their lives on an unshakable foundation. They'll choose again and again and again and again. I'm going to love like Jesus. I'm going to live as Jesus. I'm going to love like Jesus. I'm going to live as Jesus. And in that process, the wise person becomes human again the way God always dreamed but the foolish person who does not choose that, in the end, they'll lose it all. He's affirming a really important spiritual principle here, that practice makes permanent. This is not about us being wowed by the words of Jesus. It's not about us saying, man, I'm so impressed with his wisdom. I think he really maybe is the smartest person who ever lived. Wow, that's really good stuff. Yes, we need to see that so we know what to practice. 
But at the end of the day, the question is, am I going to practice it? It is the practicing of it that etches Jesus' teaching deep into my character. Practicing it is what makes it permanent. Practice is everything. Help me out with this. Transformation requires what? Okay, I'll set you up again. And y'all are going to pay way more attention to the next 15 minutes than you did in the first five. Okay, no, I'm kidding. Let's try it again. Transformation requires, I'll help you, practice. Becoming requires? Practice. Change requires? Practice. Absolutely. It's not just believing it. Not just saying in my head, I get it. I'm kind of impressed with that. It's doing it that makes all the difference. Repeated practice. I'm going to put in my reps. I'm going to do the actual workout routine, Jesus. This is how the words of Jesus go from being a good idea to a God idea. It's the practice that makes them permanent. Foolish builders know, and they may even believe all the same things. They're just not consistently acting on it. I mean, in Jesus' metaphor, they both built a house, right? It's just that it's not only what's above the surface that tells you about the condition of that house, it's what's below the surface too. Yeah, it's not just going to the gym, it's working out while you're in there that makes the difference. And Jesus is saying this foundation matters. And for a while, it might not be obvious who has the foundation and who does not, but eventually it will be. Eventually you're gonna say, does he work out when he's over there? Like his biceps look exactly the same as they did like six months ago. I don't think he's actually, is he just going to the gym? I don't know. Eventually people will know. Jesus just got done saying like weeks ago here, but like two minutes ago in the actual sermon, just because you show up and call me Lord, Lord, and do a bunch of showy acts of supposed faith, that is not the proof that you're living in the kingdom of love. It's quite possible to appear good without becoming good for a while. That's what he's saying here for a while, but eventually everything gets named for what it really is. We actually talked about this because Jesus, he's building on something he just said a few moments ago in the sermon. Uh, we talked about it in a message called Ultimate Judgment at the end of the last series on no judgment. If you missed that one, it's really important context for what Jesus is saying here. I can't catch you up on that entire sermon in today because otherwise we didn't need that sermon, but I will give you a quick summary statement, all right? He's talking about judgment day. I think, because he just talked about it a few minutes ago, which is the storm he's describing that will eventually come, where our lives will be exposed to the unfiltered love of God and only what is of love will remain. He says everything that's not of love will be like it was burned away, like it was lost, like it never was there and it never mattered. When our lives get exposed to the unfiltered love of God in that way, will we find lives that are full of the good fruit Jeremiah talked about last week that Jesus talked about a minute ago. Love and joy and peace and goodness and kindness and patience. The kinds of things Paul later describes as the fruit of the Spirit. Now again, Scripture's quite clear. You are not personally at risk. Even in that passage describing Judgment Day in that way, it says, we'll be saved as though we've gone through fire, however, <laughs> But our lives will only be preserved or lost. In other words, the works we've built, the way that we've lived them, the character that we've developed, if they pass the ultimate test of love, only love remains, Paul writes. So I think Jesus is bringing us down to the end of his sermon. And I know we talk about it a lot. We've talked a lot about it in this series. But my friend, this is the currency of God's kingdom. Live for the love of God. The only way, the Jesus way. Practice love to become loving. Choose to live your real, everyday, ordinary life like you actually believe the things Jesus is saying are true. Like I'm willing to surrender and act as if that's true because I'm gonna trust that it is. That's what he's bringing us down to. And today's Palm Sunday, and you, you know probably the story of how we got Palm Sunday as Jesus is riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, coming from the east while they're, uh, they're cheering him like he might be the Messiah after all, and they're waving palm branches, and they're laying down their coats in the street. But don't forget how that week ended. By Friday, they've killed him because his love was just about too outrageous to live with. 
It was just about too outlandish because that kind of love, unfiltered, requires me to re-examine the very foundations of my life. And here we are, almost 2,100 years later, and you'd think with 2,000 years of perspective, we'd probably have a little clearer read on what Jesus was up to. Because, I mean, let's give them some grace. They're living it in real time, right? <laughs> like, they're like, maybe this is what goes on. I don't know. Maybe that's him. Maybe he's the promised one. I'm not sure. I think so. I think so. No, nah, I don't think so. Let's kill him. <laughs> right? And so we kind of look at it and go, I mean, that probably was hard, you know? But we've got 2,000 years of perspective now. We realize what he was up to. He died, as Jeremiah just led us, to free us from the power of sin and hell and the grave forever. He dies to show us this is what God is like. This is what real love looks like. This is how much I love you. And he gives us our lives back so we can live them in that freedom. And he gives us the gift of his very own spirit to dwell inside us so we're actually empowered to live this stuff out like it's true. And he says, I'll do the transforming in you you just show up and put in your reps. Do your part. I can't do it without you, but I'll do it in you. And once we accept that his love is for us, I love these words from the Apostle Paul. He says, the love of Christ urges us on. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? Could you just read that out loud with me? For the love of Christ urges us on because we're convinced one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. Did you notice there were a couple of parts there that I think were beautiful and two words in the middle that was like the hinge point? Look at him again. He died for all, so that, say so that. So that, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. Christ died for our sakes so that we can live in his kingdom of love. He did his part of the cross so we can show up and do our part in his kingdom. This is how it works. The only question, the question for all those people gathered on that hillside to hear this originally, and the question for us today is, am I going to respond to what Jesus has just shown me? Will I make the choice to build my life on the unshakable foundation of his love by practicing that love, putting it to work in my life over and over and over? Live for the one who died and was raised. Live for the love of God. Or I could say it, for the love of God, live. <laughs> it works either way, amen? <laughs> Because to learn from Jesus without practicing what he says, what a foolish and unstable way to live your one and only life. In other words, to be that close, to have it right there within range, <laughs> and then to say, nah, nah, I think I got this. Wise people will build their lives on an unshakable foundation by choosing again and again to love like Jesus, live as Jesus. And in the process, the wise become human again and the foolish end up losing it all. The wise and foolish end up with very different lives. You ever wonder what puts somebody on one of those paths versus the other one? Like, what, what, what's the determining variable of whether I decide to be the wise person or the foolish person? I'll make a proposal. I think it's seeing that is the foundation for being you can't be urged on by the love of Christ if you don't ever see it. You gotta notice and name God at work in and around you, which yes, once more, is the foundational practice in our 10 practices for becoming, and that's why it is. If you're gonna learn from Jesus, you gotta see it. You gotta open your eyes, and it's what Jesus has been doing in the entire sermon. He's been trying to help us see something. He starts with those beatitudes. That's the series we called... Uh, um, seriously, Jesus? And he starts with that, and he gives us this description of who the people will actually be in his kingdom after all. And he starts naming all of these people, and you're like, what? I mean, that's, that's not the people I was expecting, Jesus. That's not the kind of 
people that any king ever chooses in this world to be in his kingdom. But Jesus says, in my kingdom it will be. It will be the poor and it will be the grieving and it will be the humble in spirit. They're the ones who are gonna see it. They're the ones who are gonna get it. And they're the ones who are gonna want the kingdom of love I'm bringing. Amen? And he's give, he gives us great hope if you're grieving or poor in spirit or humble. And if life is beating you down, I have something to offer you that you are longing for deep in your soul. It is the kingdom of God, the reign of God. And then lesson by lesson, he's been building so our eyes could see it 2,100 years later. There are two ways. There are the ways of the kingdom of this world, and there is the way of our Lord in Christ, the kingdom of love. And he keeps saying, open your eyes to see it. This is what I'm bringing to life, and I want to bring it to life in and through you. That's amazing. And friends, hear me now. Hear me. We still have just as many competing vision for our one and only life as anyone ever has. Maybe more just because the world has shrunk so much. We got all those competing visions right here in a pocket on our phone. And it gets our attention. And it's shiny sometimes. And sometimes those are so shiny, they can outshine the simple love of God for a while. But once you ever get captivated by God's love revealed in Jesus... That is what fuels your faith. Hebrews, the writer of the Hebrews says, faith is the reality of what we hope for. <laughs> I love this, I love this turn of phrase here. The proof of what we don't see. Now I'm saying seeing is the foundation. What I'm saying is you can't see it always with your physical eyes, but you can always see it with your spiritual eyes, amen? You can always have this vivid imagination. Why? Because I'm trusting you, Jesus. This is faith. I know someday it's going to be as real as this hand in front of me right now, but in the meantime, I'm going to trust that it is. I'm going to believe you that it is. I'm going to begin to live my life surrendered to your love like this is what matters more than anything else in the whole world. I think it's the degree to which I see God's kingdom that it pulls like gravity on my soul toward it to say, I want that. That's what I really want. Seeing is the foundation. Choosing and doing, I build on that foundation. This is such a transformative practice of my own life. Um, for several years now, I've really been intentionally, consciously cultivating this practice of noticing God at work in and around me. And I've taken to uh, capturing them on my phone. I don't always get everyone on there. And some days I'm just like, boo, I'm buzzing with God. Man, this is amazing. I'm like six or seven, what we call kairoses. Other weeks I'll get one or two and then I'll go a couple of weeks. I'm like, man, I have, have I noticed God at work lately? I don't even know. <laughs> and I was going back through a bunch of those this week and I grabbed a couple of them just to share with you because they're beautiful to me. And again, these are places where I notice them at work. You may go, really? But I'm challenging you. Why, why don't you notice them at work in and around you, right? One day I noticed that leading with love is actually changing who I am. So if you, if only if you're brand new to Data Meadow Heights might you not realize that the love of God powers everything in this church, the love of God revealed in Jesus. It's, it's the most transformative thing in my life. It's the only thing that probably keeps me in the game is believing with all of my heart. There's no greater reality than the love of God revealed in Jesus. And one day I noticed choosing to lead like that, and I've had the privilege of being here for a long time, trying to do the best we can <laughs> together as a church family. But I realized, I think I'm changing. That's changing me as much as it's changing anything else. One day I wrote down, I, I've noticed that my own pain in life is what most qualifies me to help other people with their pain. Now I know that. But on that particular day, I remembered again. Oh yeah. The pain I sometimes could resent or the pain I'm sometimes embarrassed about. <laughs> the pain I think, ah, I would never pick that but I realized God has been taking that pain for years, for decades, and he's been redeeming it as I can feel deeply the pain that many of you are going through. Henry Nouwen said, we're wounded healers. All of us who help in the healing in any way, it's because we're wounded, wounded healers. Paul writes to the Corinthians, we help others with the help we ourselves have received from God. And on that particular day, I noticed that again, and I was grateful that God can redeem my pain, amen? One day I noticed that I get to give myself every day the same grace I so easily give to other people. That's a really weird phenomenon, isn't it? That I find so easy to give you grace and everybody grace. And I think I kind of operate just, I hope as an agent of grace, the older I get, but I can be so hard on me. 
And on a particular day, I, I just felt like I heard the prompting of the Spirit saying, why don't you just give yourself that grace that you would give anybody else who told you what you're worrying about right now? I was like, yeah, I think that's God at work in my life. And sometimes they don't seem all that important, I suppose. But one day I noticed, I, I laughed when I looked back over, and I think I shared this with a Get Real group. I noticed one day that I think I've discovered the simple joy of plodding. Anybody know what that word is? P-L-O-D-D-I, not plotting. That's a whole other joy, I guess, but the simple joy of plotting. I don't know if it's age. I don't think so. I, think, I hope it's maturity and wisdom and just rest in the presence of Jesus. Most of you know I'm a fast and furious, like let's run as hard as we can run kind of guy, right? But the last few years, I think, I kind of like plotting some days. Just slowly living a quiet, peaceful, plotting life, just letting God work in me in some way. That's like a new joy. I think God's up to that in my life. Friends, seeing is when I notice what love is doing in my life and I'm urged on by that love to continue to build on that foundation because the highest priority in my life, and I challenge you, I think Jesus is challenging us with the same priority. I want to become the most loving version of Brian by the time I die. Amen? Wouldn't that be a great goal in life? Whatever else comes, whatever else goes. I hope when I take my last breath, I'm the most loving version of Brian yet. We sang a few moments ago about shame. I'm no longer carrying this burden of shame, you know. And I was thinking about this this week, and I'm like, man, ah, there were some years in those early years when a lot of things like fear and guilt and shame tried to power up my spiritual life but I don't think that's been true for a very, very long time. You know what keeps me powered up? What urges me on? I want it so bad. <laughs> it's like I've seen it and I can't ever unsee it. It's like the beauty of Jesus has captured my imagination and in the good, bad, and ugly of life, of my life, I can't get away from that foundation. The love of God just keeps urging me on. I see it and I want that more than I want, anything else. It's like a pearl of great price I discovered in a field and I bury it back where it is and I go sell everything else I've got and I buy that field so I can have that pearl, another one of Jesus' stories about the kingdom of God. Do you see it? Do you want it? Will you choose it and do something about it and build on this foundation? This is the invitation of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and it's the difference between a wise life and a foolish one someone who ends up losing it all. I'd like for us to consider that for a few moments. Would you reflect with me? Maybe bow your heads if you want to, if that helps a little bit. I'm gonna prompt you with a couple of things that I, I hope you'll actually take with you from this room today. First, I'd like you to imagine what the most loving version of you would look like. If you could fast forward your life and you could imagine a day when most moments on most days, you're really loving and living like Jesus. Your life feels like it's just kind of overflowing with love and joy and peace and goodness and kindness and patience. The most loving version of you. Can you imagine what that person would be like? God, I want to see it. Second, why don't you just take a moment to affirm that would be the true you. <laughs> that would be the person God created you to be. It's the person probably deep inside you most long to be, even if you think most days it's impossible. It's, it's probably the person you really want to be. You're drawn toward it like gravity on your soul. God, that would be the true me. I see it. And maybe if you're ready for it, this would be another good day in your life to say, God, that's what I want, and I will surrender to that, whatever the discreet acts are in my life that I must do to love like Jesus and live as Jesus, I wanna become the most loving version of myself before I die. Now, yeah, it'll be 
perfect in the next part of our lives. But practice can make it permanent in this part, my friend. Remember, he'll do his part. He's the trainer. <laughs> He's the power. You just gotta show up willing to put in your reps and do your part. Say, God, I'll put in my reps. Whatever it takes, I want that. Father, help us to see what you're up to in our lives and our world, to realize that Jesus offers the kingdom of love and we can get in on it right now. God, may you deeply embed that urge in us that moves us forward toward love in Jesus' name. And everybody said. Now here's my recommendation. Dr. Brian is prescribing you to do that same exercise one time every day this week. Take once daily and repeat. You can do that exercise anytime, right? Just pause and say, what, what would the most loving version of me look like? And do I still want that today? Do I want that in this moment? Do I want that in this situation with this person? <laughs> Whatever else I notice, good, bad, and ugly, is that what's urging me on? Repeat as necessary and let the beauty of God's kingdom just pull you in so the love of Christ will urge you on. I have good news for you today. To learn from Jesus without practicing what he says is a foolish and unstable way to live your one and only life. But wise people will build their lives on an unshakable foundation of choosing again and again and again. I'm going to love like Jesus. I'm going to live as Jesus. The wise will become human again in the process, the way God always dreamed. And the foolish will lose it all. We're going to celebrate communion together before we go. On this Palm Sunday, I hope all of us will remember the love of Christ urges us on because we are convinced one died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all so that those who live, us right here, might live no longer for themselves but for him who died and was raised for them. Amen? And so as you come, and everybody's welcome to come, if you're online, hope you saw the notice and have something prepared to join with us. You're gonna take the broken body, the bread, and you're gonna take the shed blood, the cup, back to your seat. And when you're ready, just reflect on this, maybe that same exercise we just practiced. And when you're ready, say, it's the love of Christ that urges me on in this life of faith. Eat and drink to remember. One died so all can live for him who died and was raised for us. Amen? So good. And because we're baptizing next Sunday and it would be a phenomenal opportunity for you to be baptized on Easter, to simply affirm publicly, this is my pledge of allegiance to the kingdom of love. I'm gonna be baptized so everybody will know I'm building my life on the solid rock of practicing the love of Jesus. I want to become the most loving version of myself in the time that I have left. You come and celebrate. We will lower you under the water. Died with him. The old is gone. We will raise you up. Raised with him. The new has come. And I'm going to take my bread and cup, and I'm going to go to the back of the room, and Greg Amalong is going to be back there as well. And once you come and get yours, as you're headed to your seat, take a little detour and see one of us, and we'll be happy to pray with you. Just write down your content information so we can call you this week and work out the details, or answer questions if you may have it. But just come and tell one of us, I want to be baptized next Sunday. You can do it right now while we celebrate communion, and you're already on your feet, all right? And then you can go to your seat and eat the bread and drink the cup to celebrate your new life in Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this act of remembrance that your people have been doing for this purpose since that very first Holy Week. As we eat this bread and drink this cup, I pray we would remember that this is what love looks like. Love that says we are worth more to you than we could have ever imagined. <laughs> that you have come to be with us always that we're invited to live in your kingdom of love and Lord, to carry your body in our own bodies from this place into our world so desperately in need of you. Father, may we surrender to that again today in this act. And for those who may choose to be baptized in that rite of passage we'll celebrate in this room next Sunday, I pray that you'd give them the courage and the longing to say yes today. We do this to honor Jesus. 
whom we love most of all. Amen.